master both in quantity and quality for they had given this part of their services in all their meetings a leading place among the most noted leading voices were those of my host alonzo d dick jeremiah johnson oren johnson and thomas comic so thus we introduce the publication of indian melodies in our presentation now for some of you this uh what we're what i'm about to talk about might be review certainly to gabriel who's a uh, an expert. <laughs> it is likely that Comic and the Brotherton Christians would have sung in the style of New England singing schools, which was typical in the Northeast during the generation that founded the Brothertown movement. This style is practiced and known today as shape note singing, named after the pedagogical notation style that enables tunes to be taught and learned more easily. In the mid 19th century, soon after the Brotherton Indians left the Northeast for Wisconsin, the New England singing school tradi tradition began to be supplanted by more European and so-called scientific musical aesthetics, as Lowell Mason, Thomas Hastings, and other music education reformers deemed the idiosyncratic harmonic and rhythmic style of shape note singing to be too rustic. However, shape note singing continued west of the Appalachians and in the American South, during folk revivals of the mid and late 20th century, it spread across the country and continues to be practiced today, including by folks that are here with us. Uh, as we learned in conversation with the shape note singer and scholar Gabriel Castell, who is also here, <laughs> Indian <laughs> Melodies stands out in its time, a shape note tune book created by a single composer half a century after the better remembered New England examples. It is also unique in its musical characteristics. While Comic wrote the melodies to his songs, the aforementioned Thomas Hastings harmonized Comic's tunes in the reformed European style. Thus, his harmonies do not always reflect the idiosyncratic shape notes style to which the printed shape notes gesture. Castell thinks it's unlikely that Hastings' harmonizations actually reflect the style of singing of the Brotherton Indians in Comic's time, although this is impossible to know for certain. So at this point in our presentation, rather than analyze the music further or go into extensive detail about the contents of the tune book, we attempted to connect Comic's concerns published in his preface to the history of the Brotherton's Christian and singing culture. Comic candidly writes that his object is to make a little money, whereby he may be enabled by wise and prudent management to provide for the comfortable subsistence of his household. But he also wrote in the preface of his worry that judge prejudice may preside and condemn his, that is Comox, work to the deep and silent shades of everlasting oblivion without even a hearing. Comox names nearly all of his 120 tunes in Indian melodies after native individuals, groups, and places, particularly those of tribes nearly extinct. Our host today, Megan, wrote to us that the following about Indian melodies and Brothertown's cultural vitality. Komak was an Indian, and this identity permeated everything he did and was. He felt the sorrow and trials of our ancestors, and he feared the loss of their memory as he contemplated what seemed to him the extinction of Brothertown in a generation or so. That is the angst he felt, the deep, strong roots of tribal and ancestral love coupled with the sure knowledge of it all passing into the quietly forgotten. 150 years later, that is the fight Brotherton is still fighting. We fight against the forgetfulness of time, the loss of our culture, the obscurity of our ancestors, and the finality of tribal death. We are an enduring people. So before moving on to the second half of our presentation to the Institute of Sacred Music, we'd love to hear feedback from you all on our argument about what Indian Melodies represents. And if you have any reactions to our historical overview of the Brotherton people from the 18th century to today. So maybe we can move to gallery view if anyone has any, um, any comments on that or questions. How does it feel to be quoted? <laughs> <laughs> You're muted, uh, me. Uh, 
might be unavoidable if you're recording. Yeah. Oh uh, no. Oh no. <laughs> I wish my connection was stable on my end. For some reason, my computer keeps jumping off. Yeah. Um, Sorry, we saw that we're losing bits. So I missed all of it. <laughs> oh no. Um, so I, I have to leave it to Mark and then. I can talk. I've got rid of my picture, so now I can talk to you. Okay. <laughs> I have nothing to say. I'm just saying I can talk. <laughs> <laughs> If you wanted to, you could. Huh? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, how does it feel to be quoted at Yale, Megan? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> the, uh, um, Go ahead. Um, the, 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 the comment was made that the, uh, um, uh, the, the singing school style, uh, you know, later named for the shape note, uh, pedagogical notation, um, was, was likely the style of the, of the singers, of the, the Indian singers in, in, the, in the days of the founders of Brother Town. Um, it's not only because uh, the singing schools and that style was you know, prevalent uh, in the area at the time that we can think this. There's, there's stronger, better evidence um, and no need to get into all the details of it, but uh, um, a lot of the a lot of the letters of Eliezer Wheelock's students uh, and and himself uh, and some knowledge of some particular tune books that were sent as gifts to be used at the school and, and by some of the missionaries further west, uh, which uh, Samuel Kirkland, another Wheelock student, a, a white student of Wheelock's, who who worked with the Oneida, lived out in Oneida country for the last final 40 years of his life plus. Um, he got some of those books that were sent from England uh, as another result of uh, Samson Ockham and Nathaniel Whitaker's uh, a preaching tour, fundraising tour in England. They didn't only get money, they got like a lot of hymnals and primers and reading books and tune books sent to them. And and, and we've, we've got like specific titles and tunesmiths uh, and uh, and, and, and some, some details of, about, you know, singing in three parts and, and uh, um, other observers who talk about, oh, they only sang the melody that, and they call it the tenor or call it the lead. And, and they, they, there, there's, there's just a lot of clues that, that sort of put the music style into the camp of what became, you know, shape note. Uh, the, 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 the English examples were of, of kind of the rural West Gallery people, which is kind of the English analogy at the time and one of the roots of uh, um, an analogy to and a root of uh, what became the American shape note stuff. So, so just reinforcing the argument uh, in, in those details. I'm wondering um, what we make of the, you know, Chris and I tried to make this connection between, you know, it's hard to understand what Komuk's motivations would have exactly been. He obviously in the preface gives multiple uh, well, he says he wants to make a bit of money, and he, but there's clearly, you know, it's a, it's a, um, even in wondering like w why he went about publishing the way that he did, his connection to Hastings, um, his choice to publish this music is um, interesting, and we we were trying to connect it to what else was happening in Brotherton at the time, partially to um, just make the case for the importance of this music, and I'm, but I'm wondering if other folks have reactions to that in terms of. Um, I don't know. Is that a is that a fair story to try to tell? The one that we tried to tell. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I think too you can never overlook. I mean, looking at what's going on in Brotherton that in his day, of course, is very important. Right. But I don't think you could ever overstate the fact that it it always comes down to his tribal identity. And that was so important and that he, he saw that that's not just today and it's not just yesterday, but it's the future he's looking at. Mm -hmm. And all of that, that whole area from, you know, 1700s, 1800s to who, who knows where, all the way beyond. That's, that's part of, a huge part, I'm sure, of why he published what he did. Because he wants that to be remembered and that's why he gave it the names he did. It's all about remembering your tribe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, 
I have a qu I have a question. I guess maybe um, combining. Is it, did it is it working? Am I? Yes. We hear you. We hear you. Oh, yeah, me. Yep. Um, I guess uh, maybe uh, if there's any more earlier history about uh, Comic's work as a musician or composer before this publishing, that could like whether whether it follows in in the in the tradition of the singing school because i see like the, the statements about this honoring the the tribal history are really profound and to me from from somebody who's just kind of getting into the the historical intricacies of the comic story um i am excited as a as a shape note singer because I see the ability um, for that voice to exist for anyone inside of the sh inside of the uh, singing school slash shape note hymnal tradition, because that almost none of the songs in these hymnals are named for their religious content or their musical history, but instead for some sort of human connection that the composer had at the time of its creation, a geographical connection, uh, familial yeah. connection, something. So I see comics work, like I, this is <laughs> perhaps a little bit uh, romantic, but I would like to see comics work adopting the shape note tradition as a, a venue to be able to do that to honor that uh, native heritage. So I guess if somebody can speak a little bit more to comics earlier work in composition of music and whether there was a transition where he moved towards this or whether this was just precedence at the time because it was the thing that existed in, in marginal areas of colonial America. Well, he talks about that in the uh, introduction of his- Yes. Yeah. To my knowledge, there aren't that he doesn't have. We don't know about his earlier musical history. Is that right? Um, yeah, right. Um, um, Lynn Fisher found his name in the rolls and in the attendance records at a school in Rhode Island when he was a youth. Um, uh, but it wasn't uh, teaching music. It was it was just you know learning English literacy. And uh, he didn't attend too much. And man, is he a good writer. I mean, he must have been an incredible smart dude. He got like the full benefit of that schooling in just no time. Um, really amazing. Um, in his preface to the tune, we, we don't know of anything else written until Indian Melodies just comes and it appears seemingly out of nowhere, just, you know, fully formed. It's like Minerva jumping out of Jupiter's forehead, you know, just incredible. Um, and, and, uh, uh, but he describes in the preface that um, himself, he had not even begun the scientific, and he uses that word, which is usually the, the antithesis of shape note. Um, uh, he says, I, I didn't begin the study of music in a scientific way myself until just only 10 years ago. And so somehow or another in self-study through books, it, it seems, or we don't know of like any particular person that he studied with, uh, but somehow or another, he tried to like um, get get himself kind of more more credentialed in, in in kind of a kind of a white European kind of a way. I mean, the, the, the scientific is really the code word for like conservatory European slick harmony voice leading, um, and it's a really surprising comment uh, compared with what he actually wrote, you know, because it seems you know different. There were little clues in a couple of his uh, in, in 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 his footnote to uh, the old Indian hymn where he mentions that that main melody um, is a tradition of the Narragansett Indians and that they heard that melody in, in the air, he says, uh, um, even before the arrival of the whites in, in Plymouth, in, in North America, and that 
after they, the whites arrived at Plymouth, they had the same melody and the Indians heard them singing it when they were in uh, divine uh, service, in, in, in worship, and knew it as well as them, and so they joined in singing with it, and they sing it still to this day with the words given here, and he has words with it. And so so he's, he's claiming a, a Narragansett tribal memory of hundreds of years already at the time that he's writing, and, and that he's Narragansett and came from Rhode Island and was, you know, so he, he, he's, this is all a sort of a, a, just a very single little data point that we can use to infer that he was a part of an active living uh, oral tradition of music since when he was a little kid in Rhode Island. Um, and then, you know, in the 10 years prior to actually publishing the book, he tried to kind of back up that oral background with, uh, with a more formal European kind of training. Uh, it maybe should be emphasized also that the book was not only published in shape notes. The, 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 his book at Indian Melodies was published in two versions, the standard notation round note version, and then also in, in shape notes. And, and the shape note books have a little note on the uh, bottom left corner of the title page saying patent notes. So he has, you know, just the regular version and he has patent note version, um, mm -hmm. which was a shrewd move to just be available to more different markets. But you know, maybe the hasting harmonizations and his own scientificness uh, um, kind of made his stuff less palatable to the to the real shape note style people. And, and maybe everything that was of his oral tradition and style and was really kind of like shape note style made it kind of unpalatable to the round note people. And by trying to make everybody happy and serve the multiple markets, Instead, kind of, it made everybody not so enthused, and the book never had a second printing like he hoped. It never, you know, hit a really wide audience like mm -hmm. some of the other surviving shape note tune books. So, this is kind of speculation on my part, some of that thinking, but those are some clues that are out there. I have a follow up question. Uh -huh. uh, so, uh, the, I, I guess, how do, how do I say it? Um, so, like, I've I've read rudiments, older rudiments from shape note hymnals that do speak to to the scientific. Uh, so it's not void. I mean, it's not like the shape note history is not devoid of the mention of science. Over, I agree with. I I think I agree with what you're saying that like it's it's not. It it was certainly a more. Europe like, the people who were singing shape note music would not have thought of it in that way. And a lot of the people that were even composing it were not composing out of a scientific, but, but some of the early rudiments and in, in this era, right, were mentioned the, the concept of science and music combining to create this uh, spiritual communication, et cetera, whatever. But without going into that, I guess, whether it's relevant to talk for a little bit about like the, the really close timeline of Hastings involvement and like, what was this just like you got into it just a second which is what made me want to ask ask this is like was this just um a financial decision a market decision you know like what who got involved when and how did that happen and how is that relevant to what's to how this all kind of plays out now you're talking about why why hastings harmonized well, why Hastings was chosen as the harmonizer, or like, I guess what, maybe just some more specifics about the timeline about right around now. Um, right around the publishing time? No, no, right around, right around 18, right around the publishing of the book, like previous to the publishing, right around the work yeah, yeah. Around uh -huh. the book. And like how, how prevalent Hastings was and whether this was kind of like, Hastings was emerging as a leader and somebody who was obviously like kind of becoming an imposing figure figure in the community. Uh, I, I don't know. I guess, I guess I'd just like to hear a little bit more. Hastings, like, Hastings was, Hastings was uh, pretty old already. He was, I think, around 70, plus or minus a few years at that time. Uh, so he, he was older and he was, you know, toward end of a, an illustrious career way beyond established. And, I forget. I'm sorry if I have been remiss in spreading this around some. Uh, least. Oh, Chris, did I send you guys? Um, um, I, I managed uh, just uh, like a month ago, a few weeks ago, to uh, uh, piggyback a, a performance trip I did in, in Manhattan with uh, uh, staying over an extra day. And I got to uh, Union Theological Seminary and, and was able to see... Um, 
a volume of uh, Thomas Hastings' diary that covered the time when he was working on this. And um, his biographer had a couple of details wrong uh, uh, quoted from there. It, it, it wasn't just, uh, she made it look like it took him a week and a half. And I was like, wow, that's amazing, amazing. But he, he worked on it for like a month and a half or two. And, and he has many entries in his diary talking about working on Indian melodies today. And he, and he never gets into any detail. We can't tell what he was thinking. We have no clue from it. I was hoping for clues, like what he actually got handed and what he really did and nothing, none of, none of that detail. But, but he spent a good deal of time for a month and a half or two on it. And, uh, and he did mention um, right at the beginning of it, um, there, there was no personal connection there you know that he he actually grew up in oneida county and uh, his family moved there when he was like 12 or 13 or something like that and and he was one of the early students in the hamilton, hamilton oneida oneida. academy which was mixed uh, white and indian students in its original years um uh, something like the wheelock and dartmouth idea and, and and not a coincidence this has been founded by samuel kirkland it, it's it, it was the the prep school that then went on and became today's hamilton college it started out as Hamilton Oneida Academy, a kind of a prep school for, for uh, both Indian and white. And, and like Dartmouth and Wheelock, it kind of tapered down the Indians and became the white school. And uh, so, so I had these imaginations in my head of like, you know, Hastings actually, you know, being in class with Indians and forming these relations that, and, you know, and, and hey, you know, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll do a favor for you someday. And, and you know, come being a relative and like calling it in, calling in the favor and then Hastings. But none of that, no, not true at all. In, in, in Hastings' diary, it's, it's just like, wow, uh, what a great surprise. I, I had no idea that they, you know, my publisher gave me this job working on Indian melodies and uh, uh, just landed on me out of nowhere. And what a good thing, because I didn't have much work and I need the money. And he's talking just exactly like Kamuk is talking, like, I just need the money, man. I'm just doing this project. Great, you know. That, that was it. That was it for Hastings. And, 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 and he, he seemed grateful for it and, and, and you know, it always was kind of happy to have spent time whenever he was spending time working on it. He's like, yay, worked on Indian melodies today. And like, no, no connection, no motivation, no reason. It was just, it was just a job that kind of landed on him. Interesting. Does anyone else have thoughts or can, should we move on to the next part? Okay. This, yeah. Speaking of uh, meaning making. <laughs> um, so, the second part of our presentation to the Institute of Sacred Music was this methodological reflection on um, both uh, our orientation to the history and story of Indian melodies, but also towards the process of recording and singing from the tune book. And I think an important context to give um, when talking about that is our experience in the Institute of Sacred Music, if I can briefly speak for me and Chris, which is that there's an emphasis on um, scholarly approach to sacred music as uh, performers who are preparing to be professional, many of whom are preparing to be professional classical musicians or musicians in some right, and also um, scholars and some people like myself who are training to be clergy. But um, we, we, had ex we have experienced, I think it's fair to say, there's a certain level of formality and um, neutral distance expected between people who are studying and the music that they're learning about or speaking about. Um, and I think one could draw that connection. It's a very gen it's a generalization, but one could make that um, statement about academia more generally about this um, assumption of a sort of objective distance between the scholar and the thing that they're studying. Um, so that is very, that's a huge generalization with, that could be very easily complicated, but um, this that just gives a bit of a context of why we um, I referred to our sort of doing and undoing of this process and the moment of our turning point of realizing we had not been in conversation or in relationship with people with Brotherton folks or the tribal council appropriately and so um, in unpacking that and reflecting on ourselves there's a layer of um, self-reflection that we were inviting the community into with us. Um, so part of this was realizing that we, um, the nexus that um, maybe is true of Brotherton Indian history, but that Indian melodies kind of sits nicely into is of being both a Christian form and a native form, which is not contradictory at all. 
but that is something that um, uh, is an important thing to make a case for that those two things aren't contradictory, I suppose. And that's something that we sort of encountered from different levels are ourselves having to, in some ways, um, step back from the, the sense of like, oh, we recognize this music, we should like, let's go for it. And then thinking like, oh, this is also part of a native history and a native sacred history that we need to um, approach differently than if this were a hymn book that um, was like a Lutheran hymn book from my tradition, for instance. So it, we're gonna quote you now, Ang Herod, um, who said, we came to realize that our singing could not be a preliminary step and should not be an end in itself. That recording music with Christian sentiments written by a Brotherton composer, sung predominantly or wholly, predominantly or wholly by non-native singers on the ground of a powerful private institution that has yet to formally recognize that it stands on the land of Quinnipiac people is not a neutral act. So Inherit really eloquently um, brought together some of the wrinkles that we came into as students at Yale, um, where there are also more native communities present um, who have a stake in how native culture is presented and performed. And so we, um, yeah, we, we, we realized we had to reorient ourselves towards Indian melodies, thinking of it both as this Christian cultural form and as a native cultural form. Um, so the, another layer to this is thinking about how not only we approach the music, but how the music in a way makes its way to us. So, and how um, Negan elucidated this a lot in some of our emails as well. But I'm gonna quote Anthony Trujillo, who's a native student at Yale Divinity School, who helped us to reframe from thinking of ourselves as offering something to receiving something. And um, suggested that we think of songs as quote, creatures who train us to adopt a posture of confession and conversion as these songs enter our lives. So with this framing, Anthony planted seeds of understanding that sort of grew in the coming months. Um, at a, an ISM luncheon talk in March, a legal scholar and ethnomusicologist named Trevor Reed um, gave a presentation suggesting that songs have a life cycle and that for some, for all, there's a time to be sung, and for some, there's also a time to be forgotten. And that's not to say that Indian melodies is that in that category at all, and everyone we've spoken to has said absolutely Indian melodies needs to be sung and to live on. But I think um, conversation with Trevor Reed helped us to um, think more broadly about what the sort of institutional impulse to catalog and preserve oftentimes native cultural forms for the sake of some universal good that's not keeping in mind the, the history and the place from which those songs come and the, um, the people for whom that's, that music is um, rooted in their tradition and there's a sense of, there can be a sense of um, yeah, authorship to that song and, and that song's life should be centered in that community. Um, so with we also read Linda Tuhiwai Smith in her book, Decolonizing Methodologies, who helped us to think even further about um, a dynamic of academic institutions having often a relationship to knowledge that reifies a colonial dynamic of treating uh, native knowledges or native cultures as a neutral object to be held at a distance and examined and analyzed, and that rather one ought to realize that this music, um, one ought to recognize one's closeness to the object of study and that it isn't in fact object, but that we're in relationship with everything that we're learning about and learning from. And so thinking about this in terms of the music, we were thinking about how, um, yeah, we're in a two-way relationship with Indian melodies and with Brotherton folks and trying to decenter ourselves as experts or um, uh, yeah, experts on the music. Um, we were hoping to encourage our peers to realize that we couldn't uh, assume total agency in relationship to sacred traditions. Um, 
and we hope to impress upon them that um, we are formed by the cultures we encounter as much as we give form to those cultures. Um, and ultimately that we were connected to Indian melodies and the Brotherton Indian nation, both as people standing on Quinnipiac land at the time of that presentation and in the interconnectedness of our histories. So the questions at stake in our presentation were not only about how we engaged with native sacred music, but how we received sacred music from any tradition. And we asked in conclusion, how might we as scholars and performers recognize how close we are to the sacred music that encounters us and how do we allow music to move us and move in us so that we can be in relationship with its source. That was a, a bit of babbling, <laughs> but I'm wondering um, if there are any reflections in this from this group about the learning we were sharing in the context of the Institute of Sacred Music, if any of that resonates or not. Well, I guess I have a question of like, how has the music affected you personally? Um, can you give examples or can you talk uh, in personal terms about taking that approach and what that, that new approach has meant? Yeah. Um we actually, it's funny, we had this question during, uh, at the end of our talk as well. I can't remember who, Martin. it might have been a, a professor that asked the question. Martin. Um, Martin? Martin. It was Eric, Mark's husband. Oh, that's right. Okay. Uh, anyway, sorry. Um, so I, for me, as a person who's, my, the music that I perform as an organist is very, uh, it, it belongs very closely in that tradition of that it, it fits very neatly into the academic tradition. It is heavily and widely studied um, in the kind of, and, and, and also belongs to the so-called, you know, Western European canons, which people might refer to. Um, so for me, it involves thinking critically about what that means and the, possible um, the you know various authors and groups that may be excluded from this uh, so-called canon whether it's women people of color um, or people who who have these interesting and um, valuable identities that don't fit into that kind of academic uh, box making um, and I think, uh, you know, Indian Melodies is an example of this. It's not part of what I would perform as an organist, but it, it's um, just learning about the, um, learning about and then questioning my learning about Indian Melodies has kind of made me want to question how I learn about all of the other music and sorts of things that I study. Um, and I, I know Liesl's answer is probably somewhere else because she's, you know, I'm a, I'm a musician and Lisa is, is a more of a kind of, um, she's a practitioner of a different kind of music. So I'll, I'll let her answer it as well. I think for me, Mark, um, I, the journey of um, learning, unlearning, learning, relearning <laughs> uh, over the course of the semester, um, also like through relationship with you and with Megan and Kathleen and Caroline was um, there's the, the story of the music and the, and the, even the sense of confluence around how many different people were interested and in how many conversations we were having around it, let alone just hearing Gabriel's um, violin renditions of the music. To me, it was, it's been a very spiritual journey because I feel like I've, um, uh, I, I strove to be transparent, um, thinking I'm thinking about the Brotherton Forward mission <laughs> because it resonates so much with me. I strove to be um, transparent and, and real about what I felt like were the 
missteps and the steps that we were taking. And I was many times unsure about what was the best way forward in terms of how to approach people and in a genuine desire to learn um, and to be open about the real questions that we had. And um, it was a very, like, um, at any, at any point when someone, you know, responded with another thoughtful email, another generous offer of information, another generous um, willingness to participate, and it was kind of flooring and rewarding and also very humbling to just go through this practice again and again of um, trying to be in genuine learning relationship. And I, I consider the music as having guided me through that personally. And of course, we haven't sung it yet. You know, that's the crazy thing about this whole thing is that it's like a presentation about the practice in theory, and it's sort of crazy making. But um, I, I felt like a personal relationship to Komuk and to the music, and even just in the small ways that I've heard it so far because of this desire to understand um, where he was coming from and what that means, like why that's still important today and a very like deep desire to bring that reality to our community at the Institute of Sacred Music for the folks who we knew would be on board with us and some folks we knew would be resistant to what we had to say too. So I hope that's an answer. I mean, it's, it's not really like a, you know, we were talking about the music moving in us and the, you know, we haven't sung it yet. So, but it, there's, a, there's a sense of like the story being the leading part that, and I think the story has, for me, has led me through that experience. Does that answer your question? Sure. Yeah. I know there's not been a formal singing, but Liesl, have you sung this? Like, have you sat down and like read the tenor line? I haven't. Yeah. yeah. So, any other thoughts or questions or push back? Push back on us. Well, one thing I'd like to say is just uh, for the record, I think you did a very, very good job, both of you. And I really appreciated your reaching out to Brotherton and listening. I mean, you weren't just listening. You were listening to what we were saying, what we were feeling. And I think you did a very good job. What did you get on your presentation, by the way? What kind of grade? We got a solid pass. <laughs> I mean, it's just pass fail, but oh, okay. we passed. <laughs> yeah. okay. Although, in, I think, interestingly, we did get some, um, we got some, some, curiosity maybe bordering on criticism from the more um kind of musicologist type uh people of the faculty members of the the institute um so they you know one of the kind of controversial maybe aspects of the presentation was that we didn't show them a lot of the score and um we showed one page on the screen for a short time <laughs> Uh, as an example of showing the two names, the shape notes, just to kind of give people an idea of what this looks like, but not with the idea of, um, you know, really intricately picking it apart. Um, but it, the criticism I felt like wasn't, wasn't quite as um, like simplistic as we might've expected, which was just like, that was frustrating to me. I wanted to hear more or I wanted to see more. Some, some people said, they felt if we had shown more and done kind of more analysis that we would have, in fact, um, furthered Comic's uh, goals. So I think that's a really interesting question that that I was thinking about after that. Um, it it may it may be sort of separate from our goal in the presentation of making people think about their impulse, their their kind of scholarly impulse, and why they want to uh, to analyze something so closely. But I could see in a sort of cousin presentation to this one that wouldn't be actually a bad thing, and we would in fact be, um, you know, demonstrating. That another thing that came up was, uh, you know, is was Comic's use of um, the the sort of synthesis of what what he composed as and um, his composition with Western musical notation. Is that a kind of radical uh, composition? Like, does it represent a um, a blow against the colonial heritage of Western music? Um, I think that 
another presentation could really dive into that more. Um, but I still, even after hearing that criticism, I felt like we did, we, we had the, the right idea with not showing too much of the music. But certainly, I mean, the faculty, we got a pass, but also we had some food for thought from the comments, both good and bad, mostly good. <laughs> Our goal was, yeah, our goal was to really open up conversation about like what is it that we do here in the Institute of Sacred Music, and I think we definitely met that goal in terms of like there was a lot of rich reflection happening in the room afterwards and in reflected in the faculty comments and um and i I totally agree with Chris Chris that like we gave one thing, but like there's like at least three more really rich and important like information full <laughs> things we could have tried to unpack about Indian melodies and we just chose to be really specific to our community there and thinking about what does our community need to think about um but that work you know the analysis and the singing and all that stuff that's like so important and now it's like great let's maybe this takes us straight into the third part which is talking about the recording piece but uh, does anyone else want to jump in before we do that yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I was I was at that presentation, um, and uh, and also uh, just you know through through the process of most of the time, most of the way. And uh, I I want to really second what uh, Megan said here about um, about the deep listening. It's not common listening. It's it's really special what you guys do. Uh, um, you 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 I, I you have done real well negotiating uh, the many. Uh, many communities and interests and and stakes being held uh, etc uh, um, you're you're kind um, to the the uh, and, and modest Liesel in in your description of of all the different um, all the different uh, generosities and suggestions and viewpoints that are being shared with you well also sometimes and i was one of them like the complaints and the gripes and like almost near attacks and uh, um and 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 despite you know all of that it never seemed to to, to it never shook your uh, your calm and your continuous opening open listening and and, and that's a real uh, it's a real strength and ruggedness and it was it was good um i i wonder um you know, so I, I just think you know I, I just wanted to bring up that that aspect that you know it was not at all just you know Oh, learning and happy, generous uh, contributions from people. It was it was some some struggle and turmoil, and uh, um, and I wonder whether for viewers, uh, uh, listeners to this uh, presentation, whether uh, it, it seems to me that you've uh, deliberately made a kind of an omission that I hope to hint at without giving it away, because maybe you don't want to of, about. Uh, I just you know some of the what was actually planned and scheduled and then canceled and like you know just stronger events that were like going on and then turned around and you know just some of that saga i don't know how much that matters um and then uh, just uh, uh so you know the great listening and the ruggedness in it you know that that saga and and uh, just a, a third point uh, back at the that back at the um presentation i, I loved it that you're, you're also kind of toning down the Modestly, I think like just how actually kind of um, in your face transgressive deconstructing of of your own department in a way the whole thing was it was like wow you know and and, uh, and so some of this faculty pushed back and 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 I loved it the the people that wanted to see the music a little longer and they're like you know, you know so they have a chance kind of like really look at the music analyze it right and 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 and, and the reply the given it was just I just loved it just like no we're not going to do that. <laughs> we don't want to give you the chance to analyze. And, and, and we want to ask like, what, what is this impulse to analyze? What is this Western scholarly thing that you're doing? We want to exactly ask about that. So no, <laughs> feel that, see what it tastes like and don't actually get to chew on anything. Just chew on that. You know, I mean, I'm paraphrasing there, but you know, that, um, that was, uh, I just that was a great moment. <laughs> Uh, and it was it was it was a bit it was a bit tense. It was a, that was a, that was a stressful and quick thinking and, and dynamic little situation. Um, so, just kudos. <laughs> that how much of that was clear for 
you guys, Mark and Megan, or should we rehash it a bit more? Um, it's not clear to me, but. <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in the presentation itself, there was one person in particular who insisted he was like, can you put the music back on the screen? This, this flash of old Indian hymn that we had put up. And the response was, we're, we're trying to examine the impulse to, to, you know, pick apart the notes on the page. And so we sort of knew that if we did that, that half the room would immediately zone out and start analyzing the music and coming to conclusions about the music on the page because there's, it's a room full of extraordinarily scholarly people and also very talented people and that they would <clears throat> sort of miss this broader point we were trying to make. And also at the same time, it was like, and it's available online. Like definitely feel free to do that. That totally available, good and important work, very important work. And that's not like the main point that we want to, like we were, we're trying to focus on the history surrounding the music. Um, so that's, that was an interesting tension in the, yeah. in the room, which there were people afterwards who came up and were like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and some people afterwards who were like, that was not the right response, you know? <laughs> so it's, I mean, we were actually really trying to open up the dynamic in this, in our, in the room that we were familiar with. Yeah. I mean, if, if I can speak very briefly as a musicologist, like, you know, Yale is very conservative when it comes to notes on the page kind of things. Like there is much more, as a field, musicology is becoming much more open to ideas about music as this living thing and as this community practice and as this, you know, identity forming experience um, and is starting to become more open to different ways of understanding that in a scholarly sense. And so I think it's, it's really valuable for, on for so many reasons that you were able to stand there in that room and, and say, this is a different way of approaching it, which is just as valuable and just as necessary and arguably more valuable and more necessary right now than the dots on the page kind of thing that people wanted to press on you to do. And I think that one of the things that we had discussed in, um, in previous meetings with this, with this community of people who are coming together on this project um, was that it has the potential to be beneficial to so many different people. Like hopefully it is beneficial to, you know, Comox Music and his legacy and hopefully it is beneficial to Brothertown people who will get to experience this part of their their history and hopefully it's beneficial to the shape people who will get to participate and hopefully it is beneficial to you guys who have you know, learned so much in the process but also hopefully it is beneficial even to this big powerful institution which gets to have thoughtful careful listening people show that there are different ways and better ways um, of engaging with this really rich, really deep, really complex history and living tradition. So I think it's really great. You can see how many layers there are to <laughs> what the presentation became. Yeah. Well, let's keep going and talk about the a lot of the people in this, uh, on this discussion were part of a discussion that happened in April. Um, that was an attempt, really, I was reflecting back on that conversation. It was April 11th. Amy, is that you on the phone? It is. Okay, great. April so, 10th. April 10th, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was really just an attempt to like bring a lot of people around the same table. There wasn't a huge agenda, but there was a, a lovely kind of, um, natural way that the conversation moved towards thinking about the size and the scope of what this recording could look like. And recently, Inherit has been doing some marvelous thinking about, from a shape note community perspective, what this, how this recording could take shape, um, no pun intended. Inherit, <laughs> do you want to talk about some of your, your most immediate ideas as sort of the, the logistical point person in New Haven? Sure. Um, so I, a couple of days ago, sent an email to 
Liesl, to Chris, to Gabriel, and to our fellow Yale colleague, fellow Shape Note singer Ian Quinn, who had been in early discussions with Liesl and Chris and Rihanna um, some time ago before he shuffled off to India. Um, and I wrote to talk about um, the kind of consensus that we had come to at our last big meeting about how do we start taking a step towards experiencing this music? Um, and we had, uh, we had obviously had the idea of the big singing and we had canceled the idea of the big singing and we had come to agree that it would be best to have a small recording of the tunes just as an initial step, which could then act as a gift um, uh, are giving back to to all people who wish to you know to 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 know about comics music and also as an invitation to be part of this with us. Um, and the general consensus had been, well, let's just let's find ten people and put them in a room and record some of these tunes. And I had from a shape note community point of view become concerned that the idea of for example inviting some people and not inviting other people is really not how this community works um and it's not just inimical to the nature of the community but for gabriel and for ian and me who will remain part of this community hopefully for another 50 years or so in our lifetimes, um, the, the kind of the permeable boundary between Indian melody shape note singing and the other shape note singings we do mean that we have to be mindful of the, the, the long-term relationships um, and the long-term community building, that this has, an op this has the potential to be a moment of expanding that community and of bringing Komok into it and of bringing shape note singers into Komok and things like that, or of building a little wall between them. Um, and it concern, I was concerned that by having a small invited recording, we were potentially putting that little wall up. So what I had wondered, because I still completely agree that if we are at some point, and I really hope we are, going to have a, a big scene with absolutely everybody who could possibly want to be there, there um, at some point, that we shouldn't be starting with that. Um, so I had wondered if we could, in a way, undo this very strict dichotomy that we had established between a large public singing on the one hand and a small closed recording on the other hand and instead think of it as a, a continuum of singings um, where a small singing within a community that is in itself in a way closed because, you know, it is a, a family of participation and there are people who do and there are people who don't. Um, that a small singing within that little community just of an afternoon, no external publicity, just some people coming together to sing some of these tunes and to record some of these tunes um, with all people welcome, but in, real, in, in practicalities, probably I would say no more than 20 people there, um, might be a good first step. And that I think would be, from my point of view, would be a good first step because it's, um, it works within the traditions of the shape note community, but is small enough and quiet enough that it is not, I think, laying kind of public claim to ownership over this music in every, in any way. It's, it's a kind of a, an, an invitation to start the singing process. Um, I think it's also from a practical point of view, it's very easy to organize um, and does not take a lot of resources away that we might want to draw on later in the process when we want to send some singers out to Wisconsin or we want to bring some brother town people into New England. Um, we might want to, you know, husband our resources for 
those later opportunities. Um, I think it also, a really big benefit to it for me is that because the shape note tradition is very participatory and because the hymn singing tradition that, you know, Comox Round Note publication was, I understand, part of is very participatory, then it is in a way more kind of more true the kind of singing that would have perhaps originally happened if we have the welcoming in of people who want to be there to sing rather than saying, we would like you to sing this part, we would like you to sing this part, we would like you to sing this part. Um, so it, it feels that it is, it's, more, it's more natural both to the community kind of connections that we want to build as part of this, um, but also more natural to the music itself. Um, so that, that is what I was thinking, but I'm, I'm very interested in hearing what other people think. I, I actually have, if somebody else, uh, I, I'll try and make it as quick as possible, but when Lisa and I first started talking about this, um, I think a lot, when I think about shape note music, I, I think a lot about um, geography. When I think about it now, or when I think about it historically, Um, I think, I think to me that's, that's something I always go back to. And so immediately when Lisa and I started talking about it and I'm trying to figure out exactly where brother town is and, and, uh, you know, immediately, everyone wonders, <laughs> right? Yeah. But in my mind, immediately, what, what do I do as a shape note singer? I started thinking it's like, who do I know that's up there? Right. Like who's close, like where, where are the singers there. And so to, to finally get the thread uh, that I read today or yesterday, I'm not sure that kind of addressed, I think Jim Page's name came up. Um, as, as we think about these little, I, I, um, as we think about these little singings that'll come up, that'll lead to whatever, hopefully, right. That big thing in which everybody gets to come and sing this music together. Um, to not just think about the recording project, but to think about geographically, how can the Brothertown, uh, how, how can it, from the inception of this right now become involved? Well, there's singers up there that could be, if there are people locally in the Midwest that are involved, that are, that are musicians that are interested in this in any capacity, they can already be practicing practicing these songs you know and so it, it, like this is how shape note works geographically like there's a network and people travel amongst the network and i don't know i mean i, I don't know if, i don't know I'll, I'll stop there maybe maybe i made sense well i think i think that um something that we had discussed um Thing, so various things that have been discussed were, well, what do, how, do we, how do we get these things happening? And one of the things that definitely been discussed was, well, should we be trying to encourage singings to be happening up in Wisconsin with the, the singers who were already there? Um, and that was definitely, you know, a, a thing that was on the table. Um, but I think the... the the thing that we had had kind of started potentially working towards was this idea of well how can we how can we record some of these tunes which is not just about the archival project is not just about um the indian papers project um and in a way is not even just about having some of this music that can be given to um the brother town archive you know for for those purposes but also that can serve as an invitation to people to do their own singing um because these tunes haven't been sung much at all um in the last hundred years or so um and although there are definitely there are singers and there are singing communities who are very enthusiastic about new things um, and will very happily take a new book 
and see what they can make of it. Um, there are also singers who feel more comfortable if they know what it sounds like first. Um, and I think the idea of potentially recording some of these tunes was about working with the archival idea and working with the Yale Indian papers and working with the historical um, archives and collections of the Brothertown people, um, but also of opening up the music so that people can come to participate in it or can want to be participate in it, having an idea of what it sounds like so that we are, in a way, I suppose, not, not setting a boundary by those who can read the music and those who can't, but that we can, you know, bring the sound of it to life um, as part of that invitation of participation for whoever is interested. Could you provide some clarification of, like you mentioned, a continuum of singing or performances? And are you talking about at a specific location? I mean, are you talking about in Connecticut? Or are you talking about a, you know, a performance there and a singing in Wisconsin or is this just sort of all being thrown out there to to have discussion on? Um, I mean, I think I think there is there is a lot more that we are all discussing that we're all thinking about, um, and I think I had started thinking about um, this possible first step that we had discussed, which was we had, we had come all the way around from the idea of let's just record some of these tunes back around to let's just record some of these tunes. Um, and from my recollection, the consensus that we had come to in the last big meeting was let us in the most expeditious way possible get some people in a room to sing these things so we can hear what they sound like and so we can let other people hear what they sound like. And it did seem that probably the easiest way to do that would be to get some people together in Connecticut, New York, New England-ish, because there are more of us in that particular part of the country who are affiliated with the project right now. Um, so I think what I had wondered was whether for this first step and only necessarily for this first step, because I, I don't know what happens next. I think it's all a very big, very open field. Um, is to be really specific, what I imagined was let's have a Saturday afternoon somewhere accessible to the singers who we know are already involved in this. And if Seth is in New Haven by then, you know, fabulous. Um, but I think, you know, I was imagining somewhere in Connecticut, probably because we have access to the space on Yale grounds, which I know is something we were concerned about at the beginning, but we can work that out. Um, and we, we say to the New Haven singers and the Middletown Connecticut singers and the Western Massachusetts and the New York singers, who are all kind of our local family in a way. Um, we all do a lot of traveling in between. We all see ourselves as part of this same community. Um, and just say, we're gonna sing from this book for three hours on Saturday afternoon. And you can learn a little bit about Thomas Kumuk and about his music. Um, and we're gonna record some of these tunes and it's all very quiet and very casual and we sing naturally as we would sing, but we also have the flexibility to get a nicer recording of some of the tunes, um, if that seems like a good idea at the time. So I think to me, the virtue of this small three hours on a Saturday afternoon local singing was that it has, it has the flexibility to be both a quote unquote natural singing 
but also to be a deliberate step um, of recording these tunes and of sharing in this history together. Um, and then to use the recordings of those tunes to send them to the various stakeholders um, as a way of, I suppose, inviting continued participation and conversation as we work towards whatever the next step is. Um, and hopefully that will mean, I mean, in an ideal universe, maybe that would mean singing everywhere. Maybe that would mean singing in Clinton, New York and singing in Wisconsin and singing in Iowa and singing everywhere. Um, but I don't know what comes next. I think sometimes you have to take a step and see what happens. Can I, can I jump in quickly and ask Amy? We were talking at the beginning, not sort of facetiously, not really about um, your being close by and how much you love to sing. <laughs> but, um, I'm just wondering how this sounds to you as someone who could be there. Is this something that you'd be interested in joining or are there, are there other Brotherton folks in the area who could join? I don't know about um, who all's in the area, but it is something that I would join. Um, Yay! And, and, it, but, and, and, I, and I wonder, you know, is it an opportunity to reach out to um, some of our parent tribes? So okay. reaching out to um, Narragansett and Mohegan and Pequot and, and, um, and even I, I was talking to a friend of mine who's um, from Aquina and um, he sings and when I was telling him about this, he couldn't make the talk tonight, um, but he was like, you're kidding me. There's a book. <laughs> and I said, yes. And I, you know, he, he's like, you know, I, I didn't even know about it. Um, and I think that there might be an opportunity to include folks from the other native communities in and around the area. That would be so wonderful. I may have a kind of a, a attempt at a, sort of a short summary, also like a re-answer to Mark's question about the continuum and just try to frame this all. Um, um, I think, Enghard, you're uh, um, doing a nice job visualizing uh, this sort of an in-between option that you're describing as natural. And I think, I think what you mean by that is just shape note singers getting together and kind of doing the singing the way that they normally do and that that's natural shape note singing kind of yeah mm -hmm. um but but uh, more directly about the continuum i i think i think the continuum that you've had in mind uh, uh was like at, at the one extreme you know 10 people in a room hand picked which means also hand excluded right and that like you know so that like this is one extreme very unnatural to the normal open egalitarian way of shape note community and you know makes the concerns for how relations with all of them ongoing through years lord willing um uh but but then like the far other end of the extreme is like the 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 typical natural you know traditional uh, shape note singing community model of an all day sing of a multiple day convention where it's hundreds of people from 15 states and three foreign countries and the singing goes on for six, seven hours all day long and a big dinner on the grounds in the middle and, you know, terrible travails and turmoils <laughs> in a space that's big enough to do all that and with maybe some kitchen facilities as a nice bonus and, and housing, <laughs> and traveling and visiting and, that, and that's the other far end of the continuum. Right, just, just to clarify, what is this continuum and what are the extreme ends of it? And then Thank everything. Well, that's exactly it. what I meant. Sort of a middle option? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I wanted to clarify for myself that. Thanks. Can I um, ask um, a question about the reaching out to other parent tribes? Who, yeah. and this is a question for you, Amy, or Megan, or Mark, or who, what, what would be the best way to go about doing that? Could Brotherton oh. Forward be in a position to question, it's hard. reaching out or? I mean, certainly Yale Indian Papers Project has some relationships, but I, I wonder if it would be, who would be in the, yeah, what do you think?
I'm not sure. I guess it would depend on um, where it was hosted and um, and who sort of wanted to to be the host of it. Um, if if we wanted to do it in New Haven and um, it be something you know that happens on campus and is available then to Yale students uh, to participate in. Um, then I would imagine a sort of university or co-sponsor kind of an invitation type of thing. Um, but if we were looking at maybe having one of the nations around here host it. Um, On Crow Hill Road with the Mohegan, they got a big room called Muggs Hole in the middle of their uh, um, community government center and uh, uh -huh. that, could, that could work. Um, Nashantucket uh, uh, Pequot Museum and Research Center has a famous auditorium that wouldn't be as good a space actually for the like singing acoustic or style but but they've they've got yeah. some things. um man the library would actually be great uh that that library that's like locked and closed because they lost all their staff and their they, map room uh, the old map room is that what it is um no like the gigantic gorgeous library uh, <gasps> you're kidding the research center that uh, it's, it's like the other half of the museum building um yeah, it's, it's, it's not it's not open seasonally too then. Well, no, no, it's just shut down indefinitely because oh. uh, Foxwoods people had to, the Mashantucket Pequot had a worse time in recent years. I than saw that. In, yeah. In in, in, uh, in mortgage balloons and refinancing the buildings and they, they're actually like counting paper clips and like having money troubles. Uh, Mohegan's are yeah. And 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 uh, um, and just a little more. Consolidated financially, um, but but uh, those options come to mind. Um, it would be just by the location that they are could be very inviting, uh, just by the location when 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 news is spread to other other natives elsewhere. Um, right, um, Quinna, you mentioned Aquina, but not maybe everybody connects it. It's yeah, it'd be hard to get into the vineyard. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's Martha's Vineyard. That's Aquina Wampanoag. That's a that's a that's Wampanoag. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, um, uh, Kathleen Brown Perez is only like fifty minutes up the highway from me. Uh, you know, cruising up Connecticut River, um, and just the, the Connecticut River corridor plus the concentration of shaped out singers around Northampton area, Massachusetts, Western Mass. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that that's just an inviting option in some ways of thinking, just because of great locations, great concentration of of the shape note community um, singers. Uh, something that happened there would be pretty well guaranteed to just go off well. Um, um, just, there's a scatter shot of random thoughts on, on those possibilities. Well, yeah. But I think, I think sending out an invitation um, to folks in the area, you know, if reaching out to the other tribes, I don't think, um, unless you wanted this to be a formal brother town initiative, um, you know, and we engaged the government um, in the process too, then, that, then that, that's, um, that's a little bit different, but not impossible. Already in the sense of having been contacted with a request for permission and, and Tribal Council of Brothertown actually like they have a permission, as I understand, to yes, go ahead, handle Kobuk, uh, sing him, record him. Be sure to you know drop off a copy of the recording with us. Thank you. Right? Is that? Oh, that's great. And I also and, and maybe go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was I, gonna say, and maybe it's the opportunity to ask them if they want to, you know, be part of the hosting. And I did send an email to Courtney, who cultural mm -hmm. director, and Jessica and um, Jeremy. Uh, mm -hmm. I asking something along those lines of of where you know we're thinking about how this could go forward and um, we're open to how much you would like to collaborate and planning that or being a part of it and we can think creatively about how we seek funding for instance if someone wanted to fly out and be present um, on the that's sort of like the far end or you know or just sort of be present in the planning of it as well so. I haven't heard back yet, but um, 
I'll certainly let folks know if and when I do. But Mark, were you jumping in at one point? Well, I, I was going to try and insert that I think it's important that we do something physical in Wisconsin. Now, whether that's mm -hmm. having the folks from Yale come, the shape note singers from Yale come out for our annual homecoming or our annual picnic and, you know, maybe spend a couple of hours singing just to make a demonstration to tribal members about what shape singing is and these are Komuk songs and here is, you know, a way that you could participate. Um, I think that's a real central element of this and it needs to be. When, when's the next event that, like of those events that you just listed, when's the next? Um, when's July the next? 15th is the annual picnic. Yeah, that, that's too soon, but um, well, the, uh, homecoming, you know, the homecoming is in October. October 21st. October 21st. No, I just, I'm going to be in the Midwest for another, well, I'm going to be here through July for sure. And um, I've been, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it, 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 it's tough too because it's not, it's not this performance thing, right? So you're showing up as an educational group, like if there were to be a group of singers showing up. But uh, I understand completely how, how difficult it can be to get people to sing new repertoire in the shape note tradition. Um, I've been kind of carrying the colored sacred harp around with me as a, as I've done these workshops that I've been doing in Iowa. Um, and I understand, I mean, in the Midwest, like we've been trying to introduce the Shenandoah harmony in the Chicago area. I get it how hard it is to get people to sing new material. However, there's always that small group of people that are really interested in, uh, in engaging this new stuff. And so if there's any way that I can help from the Midwest before I make it to the East coast, uh, I'm, I'm open to that. We have a couple of people. I had sent out an email to about 30 or 40 different Brotherton and telling them when we had had that conversation back in April. And I had two people reply to it. And one guy had told me, Greg Wilson, said that a number of years ago, he and another member, Darren, had done an example of shape note singing at a Brotherton event. So they are at least mildly familiar with it. And then we have another person who's newly gotten into it, Katrina Joyner, she's Brotherton, and she has said about learning shape note singing and she's been to a singing in the St. Louis area. So there are some Brotherton that are already mildly interested at least and in, in familiar with it. Mm -hmm. Katrina has had some sidebar conversations with me uh, after she was present at the at the uh, Zoom. I keep calling them Zoomcasts. At the Zoomcast, uh, that like what this is that, that that I presented a couple months ago, and um, um, yeah, I, I I don't know. She might be uh, she might be doing more than just like showing up at shape note singing. She's had some uh, interest in in like retooling some comic book, uh, making like printable pages, editions, something. I mean, she, she, she's kind of gung ho with it all. Um, um, I mean, you shouldn't like, or is she one of the eight I don't see or something? I don't, am I talking to someone behind their back and outside the room? I don't know, sorry. Uh, but um, uh, that that's that's just happening. It's, it's a foot uh, uh, and um, uh, there's, there's, um, hmm, what can I say, uh, much ambiguity and chaos, but some, some possibility that I might myself be in Wisconsin this, this summer. And, um, I've been targeting kind of picnic time as, as like a pretty nice handy arrival for meeting and serendipities and, uh, um, and not with any plan yet and not trying to like cards in front of horses or whatever, but just as like a, you know, just in case for possibilities. I, I, I do have, um, I, I do have clearance from uh, um, uh, Middletown uh, Wesleyan professor to, who kind of manages the things and the, uh, the, the, sacred, the collection of sacred harp books that I could, you know, I could bring the tote bags of sacred harps along with me and there might be, you know, opportunities. Um, uh, or not, you know, I, I don't know, but, but just there's, there's some, 
there, there are some some possibilities sprouting in in Wisconsin and and elsewhere. That are I'll go to Wisconsin connected. in July and sing. But uh, what's Katrina's what's Katrina's what's Katrina's last name? Joiner. Joiner. Yeah. Is somebody that offered me that contact information. What was that? Is there someone that could offer me that contact information? I've got her name down. I can tell you the phone number. Um, yeah, I could send her your information if you want to contact me later. Okay. Brothertown Citizen at AOL.com. Say that one more time, please. Brothertown Citizen okay. at AOL. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think about what's a um, appropriate next step to. Uh, it sounds like we we the the sizing of the Shape Note community event sounds like it's at a sort of an appropriate goal. It's not like closed, private, not trying to be a huge, widely publicized thing. But the question still is around um, who of Brotherton and Brotherton parent tribes can come and who who's in a position to do the inviting, which is something that it's a question that's come all the way through this process of trying to figure these questions out. Um, so if, if it is hosted at Yale University, one thing I think that's important is we have a good relationship um, with the Dean of the Native American Cultural Center, De Dean Kelly Fayard, and we've also met at one point with Ned Blackhawk, um, who's the head of the Yale Indigenous Performing Arts Program. And I think that, that would, those would be really important people to collaborate with in terms of thinking about a, an event on Yale campus inviting local native groups. Um, so uh, just because of the, this broader context of what it means to be, um, yeah, I, I think those are important people to be in collaboration with. Um, and I think it is uh, important from that perspective for um, also for a Brotherton sort of endorsement, for lack of a better word, of, of that invitation. Um, and I don't know, I, you know, writing to the tribal council is important. Having not heard back, I'm not sure what is a good next step in terms of, I don't know, I actually don't have a next step in mind. I'm just sort of like throwing out some of the things I'm thinking about. In a certain sense, you already have permission from the council to do the recording project. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, you don't want to be in the position where you have to go back every week and try and get permission from the council to do the next step in the process. Um, and I, I wouldn't expect the council, I don't want to say this, but. There's some more of that crowdsourcing earlier on. Does that make sense? In case someone wants to like travel or. I think that it really works either way. I completely agree that it's really important to have people there from Brotherton, if at all possible, because this is their music and their culture and their history. Um, the question of, I mean, the, the two things you can do is you can either say, who is interested in coming to this and then let's have a doodle poll and try and work out a day that everyone can be there, which is a tremendously slow, frustrating and often impossible thing to manage because there will always be people who can't make whatever date. Um, so I would wonder if maybe, maybe the first thing we would want to do is to decide where in this general kind of area might be a good place to have it, you know, because maybe we do want to decide that Yale is not the place to go. Um, I, liked, I liked Gabriel's idea that, you know, up the, the Northwest Corridor, um, if, there's a, if there's a lot of, um, people there, you know, who are native and or shape note singers who might be interested and invested, that's a, a possibility as well. I wonder if, I, I do wonder if, if we, 
figuring out a general place to hold it and figuring out a general idea of what we want it to be will then, I think, potentially indicate some dates that are better than others. Um, venues because, always have their own calendar and venues would have their available dates and just, you know, if a place is settled on, then specific dates would just be the only open possibilities and then you just exactly, choose from exactly. those and then who's available is available. It, it would yes. kind of sort itself out. Yes. And then you, you, you know, you send the invitations out to the people and you hope for the best. And I, it's, it's not always the ideal solution, but it is the one that potentially works. Amy? So does the, does the facility have to have certain recording capabilities? No. no. I wouldn't think so. I would think that we would be able to bring things with us. Yeah, recording capabilities get carried into the room with people, yeah. Yes. But, but, but the facilities have to have like a certain recordability to them, a certain kind of acoustic, you know, no, no, no carpet on the floor. You know, things, it has to be kind of a room that makes shape note singers happy. Yes. Um, which, which shape note singers are finicky it. about those things. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yes, which it does tend to mean things like, you know, hard surfaces. Movable chairs. Movable chairs, um, a ceiling that isn't super, super high. Um, we are flexible within a certain range of things, um, but the recording will be better and the singing will be better even just for those who are present in the room if we find a room that is, that is good to sing in. Um, what about just singing in a place where they host shape note singing anyway? Mm -hmm. That well, certainly that's, makes life easier. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that, that's what is like, I think kind of more available in a better number and quality up around Northampton, up, up the Connecticut River ways, Western Mass. Yeah. Just seems like they've got venues, I don't know. I have a question and I don't, I don't, I want to be clear that I don't have any strong opinions on this, but it's just something I've been thinking about over the last few comments about location is um, when we're talking about like uh, concentrations of populations of singers. Um, I don't know much past uh, north of New York about the singing populations. So like, is there, is there anything to be said about a more diverse population like a more representative population of what is really the diaspora of singers if you go south of if you start getting further south in new england like in new york city do we have a more diverse population of sacred harp singers than we do per se in, in massachusetts what do you mean by diverse uh not like not dedicated um not geographically dedicated to the history of their tradition, like uh, like maybe more willing to, I guess I just, I've experienced meeting people from all over the country, right? Um, I mean like diverse inside, like they're from more places, they're from more sacred harp tr traditions, modern traditions, I mean, I don't know, is that is that an answer? Are you, are you trying to say are the people in New England sufficiently open to different shape note traditions that they will want to sing from comics?